Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Welcome to worship on this, this beautiful Lord's Day. It is wonderful to have you with us. Um, if you are um, visiting, want to let you know that there is coffee fellowship afterwards that's going to be around the corner in the back and we'd love to have you spend some time with us so we can get to know you. Um, also would ask that everyone take the fellowship pads that are on the inside of the pew that you um, put your name down on that and pass it down and then at the end pass it back so that people can see with whom you are worshiping this morning. Okay. And Kay Frang, where'd you go Kay? Um, oh, here she comes. <laughs> Kay Frang has an announcement for us. Didn't mean to make you run. But. Thank you. Good morning. You know when someone comes up here with clipboards, they are <laughs> offering you an opportunity. And this is regarding ushers. Wayne Love and I have worked with the ushers for a number of years. We have five teams of ushers, one team for each Sunday, and there are four ushers on a team. Their responsibilities include doing some tasks before the service starts and after, and then during the service, those tasks are pretty much visible to you. The perks of being an usher is, <laughs> are, you get to serve your church, and also, you get to put a name with a face as you welcome people into, this, into the sanctuary. We are in need of some ushers, and we are in need of some, some substitutes. On the first page, you can sign up to be an usher, and on the second page, you can sign up to be a sub. I'm going to put a clipboard on each side and hopefully these clipboards will make it to the back of the church by the end of service with names on it. And uh, Wayne and I will collect them at the end of the service. So thanks for considering doing this service for your church. And now let us continue our worship as we listen to our prelude this morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient door, that the King of glory may come in. King of glory, the Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. O Lord, open our lips. 
Please rise in body or spirit for our opening hymn, number 333, Seek Ye First. be seated. Please pray with me. Eternal God, you set Jesus Christ to rule over all things and made us servants in your kingdom. By your spirit, empower us to love the unloved and to minister to all in need. Then at the last, bring us into your eternal realm where we may worship and adore you and be welcomed into your everlasting joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I don't know what kind of week you've had. But if you're like me, there have been times when things you had intended to do, you did not do. The things you didn't want to do, you did. All of us find those times when we are, we're not the people we know we're called to be. But we have a God who is faithful, who loves us and forgives us over and over and over. And so we take this opportunity to come before God confessing our sin, confessing our shortcomings, confident of his love and forgiveness. So let us confess our sin before God and one another first silently and then together using the printed prayer. In praying together, righteous God, You have crowned Jesus Christ as Lord of all. We confess that we have not bowed before him and are slow to acknowledge his rule. We give allegiance to the powers of this world and fail to be governed by justice and love. In your mercy, forgive us. Raise us to acclaim him as ruler of all, that we may be loyal ambassadors obeying the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, here with the waters of baptism, let us hear the good news. Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. With his blood, he has purchased people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. He has made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. In him we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
God has forgiven us in Christ, let us also forgive one another. The peace of Christ be with you.
would like to invite the children to come on forward with uh, Sue Stackhouse for our children's message. Um, you're going to have to come around the table and, and up here into the uh, Good morning. The stage. Here we go. Okay, great. You know what? We're going to stand up. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Come on over here. We're going to go by the throne. The king's throne. Come on over here. There you, you want to be the king? Well, you know what? That is really a good question because I think a lot of us want to try to be king sometimes. But you know who the real king is, right? Yes. No. Who do you think it is? Me. <laughs> no. Who do you think it is? Me. <sighs> no, and it's not me either. And you know what? It's not even Mr. Kip. Oh, okay. I'm going to share something with you today about revelations. Do you guys know what the word revelations mean? No? no? Want to guess? Um, I think in the Bible. Very good. It's in the Bible. It's a book in the Bible. In fact, it's a really important book. And Revelations was written by somebody named John, who was an apostle over 2,000 years ago. That's even older than I am. And John wrote these hit the book of Revelation down because he really wanted to give hope and hope to the world because the, the world then was struggling just like it is now. It's still struggling, isn't it? Yeah, every day there's struggles in our life and struggles in our state and struggles in our country and struggles in the world, right? But we have a king that we can rely on. So Revelation comes from the word. It's, it's really what is shown to somebody or what is revealed to them. So the word reveal means to show or to see something new that you didn't know before, okay? So I brought a box here. Well, it's really a basket, isn't it? And you know, my husband, as we were leaving the house this morning, said, what's in your basket? And I said, oh, you're gonna find out. <laughs> so how about if you open it and let one of your brothers handle it, okay? No, it's not. <laughs> Take it. It's just paper. Say that again. Just paper. It's just paper. What does it look like? Oh uh, no. Let me see it. Okay. Would you mind taking Would you mind taking that ribbon off that scroll for me? Okay. Are any of you good readers? Do you like to read? Would you like to read? That's a pretty simple message. Okay. Maybe you could hold it because I'm kind of shaking because you know me up here. I'm ready. <laughs> Amen means I believe. I believe God is control and powerful. I believe God will bring me safely into eternal life with him. Very good. God will bring us into eternal life with him forever. So that is, the re is a revelation because when you guys came in today, did you know that message? No. You, you didn't know that message? What? What? Guess he didn't know it, did he? Ooh, okay, so that's a bit of a revelation. We believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as one. Sometimes we do not need to be frightened or fearful or doubtful or lonely or confused because we need to learn to trust our King, our most powerful, our leader. Okay, um, when we put him first, our king is first. When we put him first in our lives, we seek him, we trust him, we pray to him, and we follow him. Me and my papers again, right? We are assured by his promise that we will have eternal life with him. He will always be with us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your promise of eternal life. May it give us strength and courage to always put you first in our lives. We trust that you are all powerful and that you will and that your will will be done. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for coming up.
Please pray with me. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Today's reading is from Revelation 12, verses 1 through 9, and verse 13 and 17, not through 17, on page 998 of your Pew Bible. Oops. Hear the word of the Lord. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus Christ. The word of God for the people of God. The, sec the first epistle reading is from Revelation 13, verse 1, 5 through 14, and 18, also found on page 998 of your pew Bibles. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads and ten crowns on its horns, and one and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. It opens its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life. The Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Whoever has ears, let them hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword they will be killed. This calls for patience, for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon and made the earth and its inhabitants Oh, I'm sorry. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs, 
even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view. Oops. <laughs> in full view of the people. Because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. The word of God for the people of God. For our third reading this morning, we continue uh, in this section of Revelation, reading from the 14th chapter, the first three verses, and then continuing with verses 12 and 13. So let us attend to God's word for us this morning. John writes, Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his Father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one, who, no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labors, for their deeds will follow them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Would you please pray with me? Lord our God, May the words of my mouth, may the meditations of all our hearts and our minds be acceptable in your sight. For you alone are God. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as I was being brought up, one of the things I learned very early was that uh, you don't talk about religion and politics in polite company. It's just a bad idea. Right? You don't talk about religion and politics, but we're going to talk about both this morning because that is where today's text takes us. I don't know how many of you were here when we began this series on the book of Revelation. But one of the things that uh, I mentioned early on was that this book of Revelation has nothing new in it. Okay. Everything that is in the book of Revelation is in the other 65 books of the Bible. But John, as, as a prophet, as a pastor, and as a poet, he retells what's in the other 65 books in such a way that it, it engages our imaginations in a new way and speaks to us afresh. Nowhere is that more apparent than in the first story we read this morning, that vision in chapter 12. It's a story that, that we know well. We talk about it every year. It's in Matthew, it's in Luke. We know the story about, about the shepherds in the field and the angels appearing to them about Mary and Joseph traveling to Bethlehem, about the birth of this little baby and having, having him laid in a manger, and the Magi showing up. We, we know this story, and it's sweet, and it's, it's kind of nostalgic and gentle and encouraging, and it's the Christmas story. And yet John retells the story of the birth of Jesus in a very different way. He talks about a woman clothed in the sun with the moon under her feet and a crown on her head, pregnant and crying out in pain as she's about to give birth, and a dragon, a 
a dragon who does not want that birth to happen and is set to devour the child as soon as it's born. John retells this story in, in ways that are new and startling and they engage our imagination because he wants us to understand that the birth of Jesus is not just an important thing that happened one time. The birth of Jesus is not just an event that, that changed the course of human history. The birth of Jesus is the center of all history. The incarnation, the nativity, is the event that makes all the rest make sense, that holds it all together. Christ's birth isn't just earth shattering, okay? it's cosmos shattering. Okay? It changed everything. It's the most significant thing that has happened ever. Okay? And this, the devil, Satan, the dragon, did not want it to happen. And John gives us some, some hints about what's going on here. First of all, we know he's talking about the birth of Jesus because he tells us in the fifth verse here, he says that she gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. Rule with an iron scepter. He's quoting from the second psalm here. Psalm 2 is a, a messianic psalm that, that predicts what will happen when Messiah comes. It's a story about, about the Christ, and he quotes it here so that we know that's what he's talking about. But notice something else in that verse. He says, this child will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. Okay. Brothers and sisters, that is a political statement. Okay. He's saying that this one who was born way back when is the one who will sit on the throne, who will rule all the nations. Okay? To rule, to be in charge, to direct what happens, that's politics. Okay? So often we think that faith and politics don't go together, okay? but they have to. In fact, every week we pray the Lord's Prayer, and what is one of the things we pray? Okay? Thy kingdom come. Guess what? It's a campaign slogan. Okay? We're saying Jesus is our man and we want his kingdom to come. Every week, we make that political statement. Okay? Jesus is the one who is to rule, the one to be in charge. Okay? And when we claim Jesus as our king, we claim Jesus is Lord, it's political. And the people that John was writing to initially, writing this letter to, they knew it. Because they knew when they said Jesus is Lord, they were saying Jesus is, is Lord and Caesar is not. Jesus is the one who is in charge, the one we listen to, not Caesar. Okay. And that was a dangerous thing to say. Okay. It's the kind of thing that that gets people in trouble. Okay. You see, when we say that Jesus is Lord, we're saying Caesar is not, okay. the prime minister is not, okay. the speaker of the house is not, the president is not, and I am not, right? We're saying that he's the one in charge, and that, that goes against what Satan has wanted to do from the very beginning. That great serpent we read about tries to keep the Messiah from coming. Because early on, we read in Genesis how that same serpent convinced the first people to turn from God, to try and be in charge for themselves, to be their own gods. And the birth of the Christ takes that away. It puts the power back where it belongs, on Christ's throne. Okay. And so the, the devil, enraged, okay, his response is to wage war against the rest of the, the woman's offspring, that is, against Christ's brothers and sisters, okay, against us. Okay. 
against the people of God who, who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. By keeping God's commands and by holding to the testimony of Jesus, it's an act of defiance. It's an act of resistance against all human authority, against all human governance. Now, that is not to say that human authority and human politics is not necessary and important. In order for us to get along together, we need structure, we need laws, we need uh, you know, governance. That's how society works. But when we put our ultimate authority in the government rather than in God, then we've got a problem. Satan does not want human authority to be challenged. He wants us to think we're in charge. And so he went about trying to, to, uh, to do that in, in two very political ways. We read about his schemes as two beasts, two beasts that come out of the ocean and out of the land. The sea beast that he talks about is a beast who who we are told wages war against God's people, given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. This is the beast who represents intimidation, coercion, power. And that is how human authority often works. In order for, for a government to work, whether it is an empire in Rome, or a dictatorship in North Korea, or human government at any time. At some level, there is, there is intimidation. You must do what we say, or you will go to jail, or you will pay a fine, or we will take your life. And when that authority is misused, when it is used not in the service of God, but in the service of, of purely human interests, yeah. it is this beast. Yeah. Governments often work in terms of, of intimidation and coercion and the threat of, of power and punishment. And John says when, when we deal with that, yeah. that we need, we need patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. Patient endurance because that is the way the world is. In our fallen world, power is exercised that way. And we are called to, to patiently endure that. To last through it. But we are also told that it calls for faithfulness. That is trust. It is trusting that God is working through it all. It is trusting that God is the one who is in charge. It is trusting that God, in the end, will bring it all together and make it make sense. Okay. Patient endurance and trust is how we, we deal with, with the misuse of power as intimidation and coercion. And people can do that. We see that throughout history, where people have endured abusive, coercive governments. But Satan says he's got another political weapon. Not intimidation and coercion, but the second beast, the one that arises from the earth. This is the beast who we are told deceived the inhabitants of the earth. Deception. Propaganda. What politician doesn't have spin doctors who take what's going on and, and try and recast it so that it makes them look good? To take things that are, that are you know, maybe not the full truth, but enough of the truth to make it, make it look like things are the way they want it to be. And so they, they deceive, so they use propaganda in order to make the use of coercion and intimidation seem palatable. Okay. Think about the propaganda machine in Nazi Germany that allowed an entire nation 
to, you know, maybe not get on board, but at least to look the other way as Jews were gathered and slaughtered. The power of deception and propaganda is powerful. And we're told that this calls for wisdom. He said, let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And that number is 666. And I can't tell you how often people have fussed over what that means. I mean, there's books written, there's shows, there's, you know, uh, it has captured people's imagination, but it's very simple. Okay. Six, six, six okay. is not seven, seven, seven. Okay. Seven is the number of perfection, of wholeness, of truth. Okay. Seven is, is, is God's number, that perfect number. Okay. And the number of the beast falls short over and over and over. Okay. 666 is not 777. Okay. 666 is almost there. Okay. Enough of the truth to draw you in. Enough of the truth to begin to let you believe. Okay. Enough of the truth to deceive. Okay. That is the number of the second beast. And those tools, those tools of, of propaganda, those tools of, of coercion, okay, are the tools that, that government has at their disposal and makes use of. Sometimes with good intent, sometimes not. Okay. But it is never what serves the kingdom of God. We, as, as Christians, need to remember that we are ambassadors of the kingdom. Yeah. And we can't, we can't live in the world and not have to deal with politics. And so as, as we look at, at a world that is not what it's supposed to be, yeah. at a world where God's kingdom is not being fulfilled as quickly as we would like, we as God's people tend to fall into two temptations. The first temptation is, is to essentially get into bed with the political system. To embrace it as, as a means to an end, thinking that maybe we can, we can bring good out of it. And so religious people are, are often allow themselves to be co-opted by politicians and, and political scheming. Okay. The image that brings this to mind most clearly for me is there's, there's a picture, again, from, from Nazi Germany. It's a communion table. It's laid out for communion. And the cloth on that table is a flag with a swastika. Okay. The church often thinks that, that the way to, to bring about their ends is just to adopt the political means that are around them. Okay. But that is not what we are taught. Okay. Paul tells us, do not fight evil with evil, okay. but oppose evil with good. Okay. We need to always remember that Jesus is Lord and not the political systems around us. And so in frustration, we may also succumb to the other temptation, which is to just back off, to seclude ourselves from the world, say we're not gonna have anything to do with politics, we're not gonna have anything to do with, with governance, okay? we're gonna lock the doors of the sanctuary and we're not going outside. Right? But that is also not what we're taught. Okay? We are told that we are to be ambassadors for Christ. Okay? An ambassador cannot like, lock themselves in the embassy okay? and not interact with the people, not interact with the, the governance of the country they are called to be an ambassador to. Okay? So what do we do? How do we adopt not the politics of, of coercion or the politics of deception, 
But the politics of grace, the politics of Jesus, where we're really given three, uh, we're given more means, but there, there are three means that, that come to mind quickly okay, on how we, how we deal with a, a world in which we are part of the political system and p- called to be engaged and called to be ambassadors. What do we do to find that, that patient endurance and faith? How do we find the wisdom we need to engage politically? Okay. Well, the first thing we do is what we're doing right now. Okay. We worship. Okay. We worship. Every week we gather together. We gather in, in, in this place, we gather in other places. We gather to proclaim that Jesus is Lord. We pray to God, not to Caesar. We come before before God, trusting him to care for us, to provide what we need, and trusting him to be in charge. We pray to him, we sing his praise. And that is a political thing. Because as soon as we do that, we're not out proclaiming Caesar. Worship is the first thing we do in order to to practice a politics of grace. Because worship shapes us and reminds us whose we are and where we belong. Reminds us that, that we may be Americans and we're thankful for that, but our citizenship is in heaven. And that's where our first loyalty lies. And so when we gather in worship, that shapes us. And the th- second thing we do is also what we're doing right now. It's, it's preaching. Right? It's the preaching of the word. It is hearing God's word read and proclaimed that helps us to gain the wisdom to see when it's six and not seven. Okay? to have the wisdom to see through the deception and the, and the, the illusion of this world. Okay. And preaching is not here to tell us what to do. Okay. My job as a preacher is never to tell you to, who to vote for. Okay. It's not my job as a preacher to tell you what party to, be, to belong to. Okay. My job as a preacher is to connect you with God's truth. My job as a preacher is to help you encounter the Holy Spirit so that you are shaped and formed into the kind of people who are ambassadors. Ambassadors sent into the Democratic Party. Ambassadors sent into the Republican Party. Ambassadors sent into collections of independents. People who speak God's truth in the midst of wherever you are found to be so shaped by God's word, so shaped by Christ's spirit, that when you vote, you're not voting what the pastor tells you to do. You're voting according to how you have been shaped by your faith. The idea that that you shouldn't be told how to vote by your religion, yes, that is true. The idea that your faith shouldn't impact how you vote is a lie. Our faith should impact everything we do including how we vote. Preaching helps us to encounter God's truth and shapes us to go out and and be ambassadors. And the third way we respond in a political world, we respond with the politics of of Christ, the politics of grace, is in the way in which we live. We live holy lives. We go out there and live with with integrity in a way that is congruent with what we say we believe. Because how we live speaks volumes. I was listening to a story on NPR just recently where they were talking about how the the behavior, the ethical behavior and moral behavior of, of CEOs affects their companies. Because some argue that, you know, your professional life and your personal life, those are separate. It's nobody's business what you do on your off time, right? And yet those CEOs who in their off time were involved in in sexual issues, they were involved in adultery. 
those who were involved in, in gambling problems okay, or, or misuse of funds. Okay? Things that may not have had any direct impact on their professional career as a CEO. Okay? And yet, when those happen, okay, the value of the company drops. I think it was an average of 3 or 4% in stock values, which is a lot of money in a multi-billion dollar corporation. Right? And the overall value of the company for, you know, for years and years decreases. Okay. Yes, it's the message that matters, okay. but the messenger matters too. Okay. And so we need to be out living lives that reflect the truth we know, that reflect the truth we proclaim, and not saying that, well, you know, what we do on Sunday is one thing, but what I do during the rest of the week is another. Okay. We worship. We engage in, in God's word. And we live holy lives. And in doing so, we influence the world around us. Okay? It is not the politics as usual. It's not the way we, we are taught to think about yield, you know, wielding power. Okay? Instead, we are doing what's talked about in, in the 14th chapter. Okay? We are learning to sing a new song. We're singing a new song about a new way of doing things, about a kingdom way of doing things, about a way that says Jesus is Lord and we as his followers don't engage in intimidation. We as his followers don't engage in deception. Instead, we worry about loving God and loving neighbor. Instead, we sing a new song that is, is like the one that Paul gives us in, in the second chapter of Philippians where we're told in your relationships with one another, in all your relationships, including your political relationships, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Okay. That is how we practice politics. Okay. With humility and gentleness, seeking to serve, and seeking always to point to the one who is Lord, Lord of our lives, Lord of the world, Lord of the entire cosmos. And when we live those lives, and practice those politics, okay, it makes a difference. And we are promised, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. They will rest in, from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. It has eternal consequence. That's John's vision of politics. And in this time and place, I think it's a vision we desperately need to catch. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we have listened to God's word read and proclaimed, let us respond by professing our faith. This morning we are using the words from uh, a statement called, Our World Belongs to God. So let us profess our faith together. As followers of Jesus Christ, living in this world, which some seek to control, but which others view with despair, we declare with joy and trust our world belongs to God. From the beginning, through all the crises of our times, until his kingdom fully comes, God keeps covenant forever. Our world belongs to him. God is king, let the earth be glad. Christ is victor, his rule has begun. Hallelujah, the spirit is at work renewing the creation. Praise the Lord. Jesus ascended in triumph to his heavenly throne. There he hears our prayers, pleads our cause before the Father, and rules our world. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Our hope for a new earth is not tied to what humans can do. 
For we believe that one day every challenge to God's rule and every resistance to his will shall be crushed. Then his kingdom shall come fully and our Lord shall rule forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, part of how we engage in, in God's kingdom is bringing our joys and our concerns before our loving Father, knowing that he hears our prayers and that he responds to them because Jesus himself is at God's right hand interceding for us. So what are those things that we can be lifting up today as, as part of God's family? What are those prayers of concern or praise that we can be sharing Anything going on? Oh. Sorry. We would appreciate prayers for our friend John, who is facing some new developments. Okay. So prayers for John, who is uh, dealing with, with cancer issues. Yeah. So John dealing with major can cancer issues. Other, other things, Jan? Yes. Yeah. So our prayers for, uh, for those dealing with the wildfires in California, both those whose um, property and lives are threatened or lost, um, as well as those who are on the front lines fighting them. Uh, so other things. A friend who needs new lungs. Okay, so prayers for God's presence with them and, um, and for those new lungs. Anything else this morning? Yeah, Judy? Yes, it is great to have Joan back with us for, uh, for a while. Um, so, yes. Thank you, Linda. Do you know the baby's name? Okay, that's, God does. So, it, okay, thank you, Linda. Uh, so just a, a prayer of praise for, uh, for prayer support and, and such for Linda throughout her time and, and for this 18-month-old who uh, got hold, held, hold of a nail gun and is on life support. Anything else this morning? Well, let us turn to God in prayer. Lord, our God, we praise you that we can bring our prayer to you knowing that you are faithful and you are able because you are our king, you are our God. And there is nothing that is outside of your, uh, of your reign. And so we come before you trusting and confident that you hear our prayer and you respond. And so we pray this morning, Lord, for, uh, for those who are in need of your of your healing touch and of your presence as they deal with sickness and injury. We pray for this man or, or woman who needs lungs. We pray for uh, this 18-month-old child. God, we lift up John who is in, uh, dealing with uh, just a, a bad turn in his cancer. For Debbie Allen who is also dealing with cancer. And, um, and many others, Lord, we know who deal with, with cancer or other diseases. We are, thank you, are thankful for doctors and nurses and, uh, and medications that can help treat them. But we know, Lord, you are, uh, you are the one who knits us together. So be with them. Bring, bring healing uh, in body and in spirit. God, we pray for those in California who are dealing with the fires. We pray uh, for those who have lost property, for those who have lost their lives, for those who have had to flee their homes. And we pray for those women and men who are on the front lines fighting the fires, Lord, for their protection, uh, for their encouragement, for their stamina as they deal with the, these challenges. And Lord, we pray, for, uh, we pray for our nation where politics has become um, 
politics has come to replace faith for many people, Lord, where we put our trust in a party or in a politician rather than in you. And because our trust is misplaced, we respond with anger and, and fear as we deal with those who disagree with us. So we pray, Lord, for your wisdom and your endurance and your faith as we seek to be those who bring uh, a new song to our politics. And God, we, uh, we know that there are prayers that have been unspoken. There are prayers that feel too personal, too painful, too trivial. But we entrust all of them to you knowing that you care for us because of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we prepare to receive our offering this morning, let us remember that uh, God calls us to offer our whole lives to him, that there is nothing that he does not claim as his, whether it is our, our resources, whether it is our politics, whether it is our relationships, uh, everything we do in private and in public, so as you place something into the plate or as it goes by, imagine putting your entire self into that as we offer ourselves to God.
dearest Heavenly Father, please bless everything that has been given and the giver, and bless all that we do and all that we are so that we work very, very hard to serve you in every aspect of our lives. Amen. Please join us in our closing hymn, number 139, Come Thou Almighty King. As we faithfully live our lives in the coming week, what does God call us to do? God calls us to be a Christ-centered, missional church that proclaims the Word of God and demonstrates the relevance of His Word to all people. And brothers and sisters, as we leave this place, let us remember we have a new song to sing. So let's go canvas our neighborhoods and sing that song. And let us go with God's blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest on and abide in us now and evermore. Hallelujah and amen.